we're talking tonight about what it means to be a Christian. What is a Christian? How do you know if you are one? Or if you're someone who rejects Christianity, you need to know exactly what it is you're rejecting. You know, so I'll talk to people sometimes that you'll bring up Christ and what it is to know him, and they'll go, no, 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 I don't want any of that. You go, okay, what do you think that is? And they'll explain something, and you'll go, okay, yeah, um, I don't know what that is, and, um, and I don't want that either. So I reject it too. We reject it together, you know, and uh, so... Uh, before we move any further into a book that will tell us what Christians do, we need to figure out what a Christian is. And that's what Paul's going to talk about in his intro. Uh, if you missed last week where we are, Paul is writing this letter to the Thessalonians. They're a group of people that Paul had preached to. He had gone to the city of Thessalonica and he had preached to them and he had gathered a little community, a church. But then persecution broke out and it became very unsafe for them, for him to stay. And so he had to leave but he felt very uncomfortable about that because they were young believers for the first time in their life out on their own, and he was worried about them. And I can relate to that. Uh, I remember when I was a youth pastor, I left my ministry after five years, and it was hard to leave. Even though God was calling me to seminary, I was very clear on that. It made me nervous to leave them. You go, okay, I'm going to go, and I want to make sure you're okay. And so I was nervous when I go back. What are they going to be like? How are they going to turn out? I was scared I was going to show up. And suddenly they're all running guns and into prostitution. I'm like, you're smoking? You're seven. What happened? You know, like, I'm terrified of what may become of them. So I remember it was thrilling for me the first time I went back and saw them worshiping and serving and working in the children's ministry and sharing the gospel with their friends and growing in the Lord and becoming nurses so they can be missionaries and things like that. And, and I got to tell you, there's nothing more satisfying to a young minister of the gospel to see his people growing and, and flourishing. Some of your youth pastors will write us notes that they just celebrate that they sent you off and they're seeing you grow in college. Some of your parents send us money because they see what God's doing in your life in college and they're so grateful and they attribute it to us. They're like, here you go. And we're like, oh, it really wasn't. Okay, we'll take it. Uh, but it's the Lord, but we'll take the money. Um, kidding. But that's where Paul was. Paul left them and he was worried about him, so he sent Timothy back to check on them. He's like, Timothy, just sneak in incognito, see if they're okay. And Paul was worried. Tim was going to come back and go, uh, Paul, uh, it's Lord of the Flies over there. Man, uh, they're painted up, killing each other. All right, the weak ones went first. Um, Paul's terrified. But when Timothy comes back, he hears the message, and Tim tells him, hey, Paul, they're blowing up, dude. God's doing stuff there that's unreal. And so... Paul celebrates that. He's thrilled by that. He's thrilled about what God's doing in their young lives. And so he writes them a letter celebrating them. And that's where we are in this text. We're at this intro where Paul is celebrating what's going on in their life. And he says, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. He says, every time I pray, you come up. And when you come up, I'm thanking God all the time. And so he's celebrating them. And you go, what's got him so excited? What he's celebrating, quite simply, he's celebrating that they're Christians. But he doesn't just say, man, it's just so awesome, y'all are Christians. That's not what he says. He celebrates particular things about them. And in doing that, he's explaining to them and to us what a Christian is and how you, how you know you're one. And so we're going to look at that. And really, there's, we're just going to see four things. And we're going to move through them pretty quick. But he's going to celebrate. I th see these things in your life. This is, this is what a Christian is. This is what's happening in the life of a Christian. And so he says in verse 3, he says, I thank God for all of you. And then we'll skip, we'll come back to what he says next. But in verse 4, he says, knowing, it's a participle, or for I know. He says, I thank God whenever I think of you. And when I do, it's because something's in my mind. And so our first point is verse 4. He says, I thank God when I think of you because I know, brothers loved by God, that he's chosen you. And that's your first point. What's a Christian? Someone God chose. Christianity doesn't start with us. It starts with God. Christians are chosen ones. Because God chooses people. He did it all through the Bible. He chose Abraham. You find out in the Old Testament that the whole world is pursuing idols, and as everyone's moving that way, so is he. But God comes to one man and says, no, 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 not you. i got a different path for you. And the book of Joshua says, and he took Abraham. Nehemiah 9 says that he chose him and pulled him out of the land of earth. says, I'm doing something else with you. He chose Paul. Paul wasn't looking for religion. Paul was on his way to go kill Christians. That was his job. That's how he got his paycheck, killing Christians. And he's just daily grind. I'm going to go kill some Christians. And God said, you know what? Not today, bro. Not today. I'm actually going to make you one. And so God grabbed him 
and said, I'm making you something else. He chose Lydia. We find out in Acts 16, Lydia was a seller of purple, which I just love that. She was the city's seller in purple. You want purple? Go see Lydia. And she's just in there working it, and it says, and God opened her heart to believe the gospel. And then Acts 13 says the gospel was preached in Pisidian Antioch, and it says to those who were appointed, as many as were appointed to eternal life, they believed. And so you see all through the scriptures, God picks idolaters, he picks murderers, he picks purple sellers, he picks all different kinds of people. It says, I'm grabbing you and I'm making you mine. You're mine. You're, okay, so a Christian someone God grabbed, God, God chooses, on what basis? Why is he grabbing people? Well, scripture makes it real clear. It's not based on anything meritorious within you. It's not based on anything you've done or will do. It's not based on your activity. Ephesians 2 is real clear. It says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. By nature, a child of wrath, but God being rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. By his grace, you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. He says, God's saving people. You didn't do anything, so you can't boast about it. And 1 Corinthians 1 says the same thing. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. He chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. He chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing those who are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. For those who know God, when we come to see him face to face in heaven, what will not occur when we walk in is God won't go, he's here, everybody. Come on, everybody, he's here. You did it. You did it. I made it tough. I hit it a little bit, made it puzzling, but you figured it out. I don't know what the rest of them were doing, but you knocked it out of the park, chief. Get in here. It's not going to happen. It says that nobody boasts. There's no room for boasting. He didn't do anything. And so God picks people who were dead and he makes them alive. And it's not based on you. So all the celebrating a Christian does is of God, not of ourselves, because we didn't do anything. We didn't do anything. On what basis then? The Bible just says by his own grace. Ephesians 2 says because of his great love with which he loved us when we were dead, he made us alive. First Thessalonians, our text just says, brothers beloved by God, he chose you. He just loved you. Deuteronomy 7, he's talking to his people in the Old Testament. He said, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And it's not because you are more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you are the fewest of all people, but it's because the Lord loves you. Did you catch what he said? I didn't love you because of anything about you. So why did I love you? And he gives you an answer. He says, I loved you because I loved you. That's his reason. That's his argumentation. I loved you. Why, God? Because I just loved you. I just chose to. It was nothing about you. And so we are people who God rescues, and it's nothing based on us. He chooses. He grabs. Uh, and if he didn't, we'd be lost. We'd be lost. Romans 3 says there is no one righteous. No, not one. No one seeks God. There's no one looking for him. We're just doing our own thing. Ephesians 2 says we were dead. We were like Lazarus in the grave. And Jesus came and said, get up, not dead anymore. Or 2 Corinthians 4 says we were blind. The, uh, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. And the case of the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ. But the God who said let light, light shine out of darkness, he has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. We were running away, and he grabbed us. We were dead, and he made us alive. We couldn't see the beauty of God, and he gave us eyes. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. Now, some of you go, well, Ben, I, I, don't, I don't know what to think about all this. This is a lot to think about. Well, some people will say, Ben, does this make us, I mean, a robot? Like, God chose me? Does that mean I don't have a freedom of choice? Like, does he, did he pressure me? Well, No. God's choosing doesn't negate human responsibility. God will call us to act and he'll mean it. Uh, John Calvin said this, we must not suppose that there is a violent compulsion as if God dragged us against our will, but in a wonderful and inconceivable manner, he regulates all the movements of men so that they still have the exercise of their will. So he says, hey, God controls everything and he grabs people and makes them his kids. 
And you go, so are we robots? We don't have freedom of choice? He says, no. In some inconceivable manner, we make choices. And yet as we make choices, God still runs everything. Is that confusing? Yes. Are there questions with that? Yes. Charles Spurgeon said this about God controlling all things and yet humans being responsible for our activities. He says these are two lines that are so nearly parallel that the human mind which pursues them the farthest will never discover where they converge. But they do converge and they will meet someday in eternity close to the throne of God whence all truth doth spring. Does God rule everything? Yeah. Do we still make choices? Yeah. How do those fit together? I don't know. God doesn't bother to tell us. He doesn't bother to tell us. And so there's mystery to that, but there's beauty to it. And here's the thing. We, we can make that a source of argumentation and battle, and we're never meant to. Did you know in the Bible, whenever this comes up, God grabbing people, it's always meant to encourage you. It's always brought up in the context of encouragement. That, hey, the whole world left you. They abandoned you. You were on your own. But God came and grabbed you. And he knew you were a mess. There were no secrets. He wasn't misinformed like, oh, I thought you were different. He knew exactly what you were. And he grabbed you anyway. And there's mystery to that, but there's freedom to that. There's something about it. And we've made that an issue of debate and argument. And I just want to encourage you as I've prayed about this, I hope that that idea of God coming and grabbing you out of the dark would not become something you go back to coffee shops and debate and fight about and pull out daggers and stab each other with, you know, and theological wars. It's not it. It's meant to be a comfort. Are there different ways, different ones of us understand how God's choosing works? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I won't tell the whole story. I've done it in here before. But the Calvinist Charles Simeon met with John Wesley, who was an Arminian. Well, a form of Arminianism called Wesleyanism, named after him. And when they met, I think they did it right. Charles Simeon came to him and said, I understand you're an Arminian. I've been called a Calvinist. I suppose we're meant to draw daggers. But before I consent to begin combat, can I ask you a few questions? And he said, sir, do you feel you're a depraved creature? So depraved you would never have thought of turning to God if God had not first put it in your heart. And Wesley said, yeah, that's exactly what I think. And Simeon asked him a bunch of other questions, but he ended with, is all your hope in the grace and mercy of a God to preserve you into his heavenly kingdom? And Wesley said, yes. And then Calvin, or excuse me, Simeon said, well, then I'm putting my dagger away. He says, and let's search out terms and phrases to be a ground, not search out terms and phrases to be ground of contention, but we will cordially unite on the things where we disagree. And so there's confusion in it and debate and there's thought, and I want to encourage you to go on a journey to understand that because it's all through our Bible. God, God grabs people. But as you do that, remember, it's in the context of a holy God whose ways we don't understand, and he doesn't feel obligated to explain it all to us. And especially, I don't want you to think, well, forget you. You know, I, I was thinking about that the other day. I was like, for many of us, we're what, maybe a, a decade, 15 years away from when we were first learning to like write in cursive. You know what I mean? We're just like, I just wrote my name, all right? And uh, <laughs> we've not been around that long. So if we don't fully grasp some of these issues right away, don't worry about it. But you trust that God is powerful and he's loving. And what's a Christian? A Christian is someone that God came to get because you wouldn't have come and got yourself. Spurgeon said this. He said, I believe in the doctrine of election because I'm quite sure that if God had not chosen me, I would have never chosen him. And I'm sure he chose me before I was born because he never would have chosen me afterwards. <laughs> and he must have elected me for reasons unknown to me, for I never could find any reason in myself why he should have looked upon me with special love. And he's right. He's right. So what's a Christian? A Christian is someone God chose. So you go, well, okay, that's great. Thank you. So how do I get to be one? How do I know if I am one? Well, he tells you because, in verse 5, he's going to tell you exactly. He says, brothers beloved by God, I know God chose you because, and he's going to tell us exactly why he thinks that. He says, because our gospel came to you. How do you know you're chosen of God? Because the gospel came to you. The message, that's what gospel means. Good news, the good news came. Words were spoken. So Paul here is not a hyper-Calvinist. A hyper-Calvinist is not a Calvinist with too much sugar in him. A hyper-Calvinist is someone who would take Calvinism and say, hey, God elects people, and so therefore we don't even need to pray for people. We don't need to share the gospel. We don't need to tell, tell people God's love. We don't need to call them to repentance. We don't have to do anything. We just sit there because you're an elector or not, so I don't even have to talk to you. I'm just going to sit here in a corner. And that's not God. 
God says, go, share. And Paul says, hey, I had a message and I came to you. And I didn't care if I took a beating for it. I proclaimed it to you. The gospel came to you. It showed up. What's the gospel? Well, Paul told them, you see it in the book of Acts, when he came to the Thessalonians, he told them, he said, hey, Jesus is the Christ, and the Christ must suffer and die. That was his message. There is a Christ, there is a representative of humanity before God. That's what the Christ is. And the Christ must die, and Jesus was the Christ. And then you see in our text, a couple of verses later, we didn't read it, but it says, we put our faith in a God who raised Jesus, his son, from the dead. Jesus who delivers us from the wrath of God to come. So what's the basic gospel that Paul gave the Thessalonians? Jesus is the Christ who must suffer and die. He's the Son of God who rose from the dead and rescues us from the wrath to come. And you go, what does that mean? Well, what it simply means is this, and I'll go fast, it's this. Every one of us is scared of death. All of humanity is afraid of death. And we may not say that because death doesn't feel near to us. We go, I don't fear nothing. All right, but the truth is, everybody fears death. And the reality is all you have to do is go to a funeral and people in the midst of it are disturbed by it. And so they come up with ways and little platitudes to try to comfort themselves. Well, they'll live on in our memories. But we all know that's not true. That's a memory. That's not a person. They're not living in a memory. C.S. Lewis, when his wife died, people would say that to him. And he says, hey, I don't want a love affair with a memory of my wife. That's adultery. He said, I want my wife. And she's gone. And he said, so man, I don't, they don't live on in memory. And some people, we say these little like, platitudes to comfort each other. Let me tell you something. All those little like, it'll be okay. I'm sure it's bright and shiny on the other side. All that stuff is little wicker shields against the onslaught of the war machine of death. We're terrified of death. And the reason we're terrified of death is because we know we're not okay. It's interesting in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Oh, death, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? The sting of death is sin. It's interesting, I killed two scorpions today. Apparently they were free, fleeing Hermione and uh, <laughs> came into my home. And he uses language of a scorpion. He says, the sting of death, what really makes death sting, and he uses the word for poison, and he's thinking of a scorpion's sting. He's like, what really stings about death is sin. What does he mean by that? He means the reason why we're afraid of death is not just because we're afraid of death. What we're afraid of is death knowing that we're not okay. What we're afraid of is death, knowing that as we move towards it, there's something wrong with us. What we're scared of is judgment. Epicurus said this. He said, if we could be sure that death was annihilation, there'd be no fear of it. For as long as we exist, death's not there, and when we're dead, we cease to exist. But we can't be totally sure it's annihilation. What people fear most is not that death is annihilation, but that maybe it's not. What we're scared of in death is that we know we're wrong. We know there's something wrong with us. And we're scared of being called on the carpet about it in front of the universe. That all our thoughts and deeds come scrolling up on the screen and we go, yeah, about that, okay. And we know we're not okay. And what scares us about death is that. That's what scared Hamlet. Remember when he was contemplating to be or not to be? Trying to figure out if he wanted to kill himself? He said that the dread of something after death, that undiscovered country from whom, whose born no traveler returns, it puzzles the will and makes us rather build, bear those ills we have than fly to others we know not of. Thus conscience makes cowards of us all. He says, what makes me too afraid to kill myself is my conscience. I know I'm not okay, and that's why I fear death. I had a friend get struck by lightning. Uh, he was climbing a mountain and... Lightning hit him and he went down and he said, you know, Ben, the first thing I thought is, I'm dead. <laughs> he said, and the next thing I thought was, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And he went on a journey after that of trying to figure out why was I so scared to death? It's because I know I'm not okay. And there's a God and there's judgment and there is wrath to come. That's what Paul told the Thessalonians. Hey, that great fear of judgment, it's legitimate. There's something wrong with you. There's a selfishness that permeates us and God hates it. There's death all around the world and suffering and we don't care. And there's a God in heaven who made us and we blow him off. There's something wrong with us and we deserve condemnation. And yet he says, Jesus was the Christ, the representative man. And he said, that man must die. 
And Paul tells us that he who knew no sin, Christ, who didn't sin like us, who had a clean conscience, he became sin for us that we might be made right. See, what's beautiful about Christ is we saw Christ move towards the gears of death and we saw him get crushed in the machinery. And then he came out on the other side and he was fine. And he said, if you're in me, I'm the first fruits. He says, when you come to know me, the Christ had to suffer and die. But when you put your faith in God who raises the son from dead, I rescue you from the wrath to come. That's the gospel. I know I'm not okay. And yet there's a guy who beat death and he says, trust me, trust me. And when I trust him, I'm not afraid of death anymore. Death, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? The sting of death is sin. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. So a Christian, someone who's God chose. He chose you, how do you know? Because the gospel came. But not just that the gospel came, notice what he says, the gospel came not in word only, but in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. See, it's not just the gospel coming, because some of you have heard a gospel message, and you say, I don't believe it. He says, the trick is, the reason you know you're a Christian, a Christian is someone, is God grabbed you, and you know he did, because the gospel came to you, and it didn't just come in words, it came in power. It had an effect. It landed on you and changed you. It wasn't just the words. It got into you. It jacked with you. And so as a youth pastor, I remember having students come up to me all the time. I would preach to my students. I would talk to my students. I remember one week, I took them to camp. And two of them came up to me after camp. And they said, Ben, I want to know Christ. I want to be a Christian. And then I said, okay, great. Talk to me about it. And they said, man, I was listening to that message earlier. And he was talking about the gospel. And I have never heard that before. And I went, okay, time out. Yes, you have. You've heard it a lot. Because I said it to you, to your face. I saw you out there. I said it to you all the time. And I got to tell you, I speak at youth camps all the time. And kids will come up to me and they'll just say, I've just never heard that before. And their youth pastor is like, you've got to be, oh my. <laughs> and I just look at him and I'm like, I know, dude, it's cool. Because you may have heard it a million times and it just bounced off, bounced off, bounced off. But there was one time that you heard it and you went, whoa. Okay, that changes everything. And it's not just words, it comes in power. Paul told the Corinthians, I came to you not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. That's how Spurgeon got converted. Spurgeon knew we were talking about, one of the greatest preachers who ever lived. The irony is he was one of the greatest preachers who ever lived, but the way he came to Christ was because when he was a 16 year old, he was on his way to church and it got snowed in and he just turned off to the closest church he could find. And the pastor wasn't there. There was no preacher that day. And there was 15 of them sitting quietly in a room. And then a shoemaker got up. And Spurgeon says that it is good for a man to be educated who preaches the word. And he says, but this man was really stupid. That's a quote. <laughs> and he says he was obliged to stick to his text for the simple reason that he had little else to say. And his text was, look unto me and be ye saved. And it says he took to this text and he says, my dear friends, it's a simple text. It says, look, look and don't take a deal of pain. It ain't lifting a foot or a finger. Man needn't go to college to learn to look. You can be the biggest fool and you can look. But the text says, look unto me. Jesus Christ says, look unto me. He says, and the man said, look unto me, I'm sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me, I'm hanging on the cross. Look unto me, I'm dead and buried. Look unto me, I rise again. Look unto me, I ascend to heaven. Look unto me, I'm sitting at the right, Father's right hand. Oh, poor sinner, look unto me. And then he said, the preacher looked out at the crowd and then he looked right at 16 year old Spurgeon and said, son, you're the most miserable looking person I've ever seen. And Spurgeon says in his autobiography, I, was, I did look miserable, but I was unaccustomed to be spoken to in this way from the, from the stage. And the man told him, you'll always be miserable until you look to Christ. And Spurgeon said, it was one of the worst sermons he'd ever heard, but it changed his life. He said, I had been trying to do 50 other things to make myself okay, and only one thing was needed. And how precious did that word appear to me? Look. And he had heard the message. He'd heard it from better guys. But God chose a, a simple shoemaker to preach it, and it suddenly made sense. And that's what happened to some of you. The gospel came, and it came in power. And the last point is this. It changed you. It changed you. 
A Christian is someone who God chose you. How do you know? Because the gospel came to you and the gospel came in power and it came in the Holy Spirit and it came in conviction. You believed it. And when you believed it, it changed you. He says, you believed and you became imitators of us. The gospel goes to work on you. And that's where he started the text. That's where he started. It was almost like he sees them as a tree and he walks up and he sees fruit in their life. The work of faith, the labor of love, the steadfastness of hope. And he sees this fruit, this work, these things they're doing to bless others, to help others. And he says, I know where that fruit comes from. It doesn't come from your efforts. It comes from the fact that God was working in your life and he preached to you the gospel and you trusted him. And when you put your faith in Jesus, understood that you were loved by God, you were given a joy in the Holy Spirit and it became work. It changed you. And so a Christian isn't someone who works for God. Some people think Christianity is a Christian, someone who's got to not drink, not smoke, not sleep around, don't dip, don't chew, you know, whatever. And that's not Christianity. Christians don't work for God. We work in God. God grabs us when we're dead and he makes us alive. And then he puts in us resources that suddenly spill out. There was a great old poem I heard that says, do this or that the law demands, but gives me neither feet nor hands. A better word the gospel brings. It bids me fly and gives me wings. It says just law tells you what to do, gives you no power to do it. The gospel sets you free. And then it tells you to do the impossible, love your enemies, give away your possessions. You'll have treasure in heaven, do things that you got. I don't even know how to do that. And it tells you fly, live a totally different kind of life. And then it says, oh yeah, here's some wings. And so the gospel come and it changes you. And the work you do is a work that comes from faith. The love or the labor comes from love. Your steadfastness comes from hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. So where do we end? Some people, when they hear a text like this, they, they try to come up with reasons of trying to figure out how they're chosen. Don't worry about that. Or they try to look at their works and say, if, if the gospel comes and makes an effect, I should see certain effects in my life and that proves me that I've been converted. Don't do that because you're, you're broken. The Thessalonians were broken. Paul's gonna tell them later, hey, your sexuality is, is a train wreck and, and we need to change some things. They weren't perfect. You won't be either. And so you go, how do I know I'm a Christian? How do I know I'm chosen? How do I know I'll see this good work in me? You focus on the gospel. Do you believe it? Are you fully convicted that there was a God? He sent the God man to live the perfect life you could not, die for you and rise. If you believe that, he'll change you. He'll change you. So last, last thing, this summer I was at a camp preaching to a group of students and a kid came up to me and he said, hey, you told everyone to go talk to their pastors, but, but I don't have a pastor here. I said, well, how'd you get here without one? And he said, well, I'm not really a part of this camp. <laughs> he said, I was here in New Mexico hiking with some friends. We were up in the mountains and we were gonna kind of do it rough it out back and we got out deep into the woods and one of our guys got dehydrated, altitude, got sick, and we had to carry him down. So we came down to this road and went to a gas station and said, hey, do you know where, somewhere we can take our friend? And they said, well, there's this retreat center just down the road. And he said, so we showed up here. And they were giving our friend water and helping him out. And so we saw everybody moving this way and we came here. He said, and we left and we asked him, can we stay? And they said, sure. And he said, so I came yesterday and heard you last night and I came tonight. And then he said, I just need to tell you that I'm addicted to pornography and I'm, I drink and... I need God. And he said, no, I don't think it's an accident I'm here. And I said, well, I don't think it's an accident either. I don't believe in accidents. I said, but if you're coming to me because you want to turn over a new leaf, you want to drink a little less or look at less porn, I said, that's not what I'm selling, bro. I'm not selling life improvement. I'm selling you're beautiful because you're in the image of God, but you're broken because of sin. You're dead before God and you can't fix you. And so God sent a hero to live the life you could not, to die the death you deserved and rise and you fix your hope on him and he begins to change you, but you fix your eyes on him. And he said, yeah, I want that. And then I was worried maybe he was just doing that camp thing where you're like, I'll do anything. You know, you're like, be celibate, okay, go on the mission field, I'll do it. So I was like, 
are you sure? I said, let me run that past you again. You're a dead child of wrath. You know, like I kind of dialed it up a little, you know, and, uh, and I shared it with him about three times. And he was like, no, I heard, yeah, I understand. No, I got it. Yeah, you were saying that up there. <laughs> I want that. And I said, well, man, let's just talk to God. And I didn't give him the words to say. I didn't want to coach him. I said, you talk to him. Prayer is just talking to God. You talk to him. And I love it because we bowed our heads and he just said, God, thank you. Thank you for coming to get me. Thank you that you can make me a child of God through Jesus. Thank you. And that was his prayer. And I just thought he's right on. God comes to rescue. And let me tell you something. God uses means. I don't think it's an accident you're here. And you may have questions and struggles and that's okay. God's doing something on this campus and you're not an accident and this isn't an accident. And this is the most important message you'll ever hear in your life. Not because I'm speaking it. It's not wise and persuasive words. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. And you need to know him. But when you do, he changes everything. He changes everything. And that's a beautiful thing. We're going to talk about this semester. 